So give me this handout. It's got some diagrams on it. Okay, so today um, we're going to talk basically, we're, we're going to talk all about pneumatics today. So that's what we're going to talk about. So um, we're going to talk about exactly how a, a pneumatic circuit is laid out in the context of an FRC robot. We're going to talk about the different hardware associated with pneumatic systems, and then we're going to start a project in CAD today, kind of like a gearbox project, except have to do with pneumatics. So, um, kind of all, all themes today. Uh, okay, so pneumatics is a portion, or I should say a, a sub-genre maybe, sub-discipline of fluid power. Basically, fluid power is where you use a fluid, either a liquid or a gas, to store and or transmit power in a mechanical system. So hydraulics, hydraulics is fluid power. Pneumatics is using compressed air. That's also fluid power. It's all part of the same thing. There are major differences between hydraulics and pneumatics. Um, pneumatics doesn't only have to use air. You can CO2 or nitrogen, it's all, it's all pneumatics, but in our case, we're, we're talking about compressed air, too. Um, the, 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 big, the big thing about pneumatics as opposed to hydraulics is that hydraulics aren't actually a energy storage mechanism. Hydraulics is purely a power transmission mechanism. You're only using um, the, the hydraulic fluid to, to transmit power, and that's because the fluid is incompressible relatively, um, so there's no way to actually store energy by compressing the fluid. However, uh, with pneumatics, you have a gas which is compressible. So, so in in pneumatics, you're actually you're actually storing energy in the form of that compressed gas. So, in industry, in industry, they just you know, pneumatics is used everywhere. I mean, just every piece of industrial equipment ever pretty much has got pneumatics on it, right? Because they're, they're easy, they're cheap, they're just a really good solution for doing a lot of simple motion things. So, so we're, we're doing that on our robots as well. Now at FTC, you guys aren't allowed to use pneumatics pretty much just for safety reasons, but um, on FRC, we, we use them quite a bit um, because if we've got something that we want to actuate, we don't care too much about its motion, and we just need it to go up and down or something, we'll, we'll use pneumatics. Um, okay, so, I put my markers over here. All right, so basically, uh, there's a, a diagram in your handouts, but I'm gonna kind of redraw it as we, as we talk about the different components um, on the board here, so. Okay, so the most, most important device in the pneumatic circuit is the compressor. Okay? Our robots run off of 12 volts, so we have a little 12 volt electric compressor that we're running off of our robot battery, and that's what's compressing air and storing it. So this, this is the hose, right? We're just gonna use this as a hose. This is going into a tank. Okay, it could be multiple tanks. Typically, the tanks that we have, they're not that big, so we use a bunch of them, okay? Um, something we haven't typically done a very good job of in CAD is finding a location for them, and we kind of end up just winging it after the fact and, and, and um, sticking them somewhere with zip ties, um, which, I mean, that's not a bad solution, that's what most teams do, but but the best teams find a place for them and, and design for it, so that would be kind of nice to be able to put those tanks in an intentional location. Okay, so we're required, we're required to base basically by FRC rules. Most of the most of the rules in FRC that have to do with pneumatics are, are just they're only there for safety, right? There's a lot of different ways to plumb pneumatic circuits. There's a lot of different kinds of devices, a lot of different kinds of techniques that are used in the industry. 
that we're just not allowed to do. The, the pneumatics rules are very, very restrictive in FRC, so we pretty much have to do it a certain way, and we can't really deviate from that. Now, I'm basing everything I'm talking about here off of last year's rules. The rules do change slightly every year. So what I'm drawing is, is, the, is how we're required to do it, as close as I can remember. Um, and But next year could be very slightly different, but likely it won't change much. Okay, so we're required to, if something goes wrong, and they need to just, the robot clamps down on somebody's arm and, and starts trying to eat them or something, right? They need to be able to bleed pressure from the from the robot in an emergency situation. So we're required to have a valve, this is the symbol for a ball valve, which is what we're using, attached to the system. Now, the rules also require that we're not allowed to trap air in a part of the system, right? So when this valve, this is called the, um, I th I th if I remember correctly, they call it the release valve. Now, I'm gonna use two words here as we move forward. I'm gonna use something, I'm gonna use relief with an F and release with an S. They're two different things, so don't get confused. And if you get confused, stop me and, and I'll clarify. So the release valve releases all the air out of the system. Basically, it has to be plumbed in a certain way that when you open this valve, all the air in the system has to leave, right? So you can't have like other valves later on. We're gonna, we're gonna talk about solenoid valves here in a minute. Um, which is how we actually electronically control the flow of air. We, you can't plumb it in a certain way that it traps air in a system that when this valve is open, it doesn't let it escape. Now, with the harbor views, that's pretty much, that's pretty easy to do, right? You just plumb it a certain way, it's pretty simple, and, and, and it'll, it'll bring the whole system when you open the valve. But there are certain techniques you could use with check valves and stuff um, that, that would do that, that then becomes illegal because of that particular rule. So, like I said, the rules are very restrictive. Um, okay, then, then we're going to have a, a, a hose that goes elsewhere on the robot, right, that actually supplies pressure to the components that we're, we're using, and we'll, we'll talk about that in a second. So, um, there's a couple other components that I need to talk about, and, but before I do that, I want to make sure that everybody understands exactly what we're doing. So, so this area, the volume in the tanks, the volume in these, these hoses, volume in this tank, the volume in this hose, this hose, this hose, Right, all of that plumbing, that's all a pressurized volume, right? We're allowed to store air up to 120 PSI in FRC. Once again, that could be subject to change, but I highly doubt it will change. Um, all of this can really be arranged however you want, right? There's really no reason that you have to have like a, a four-way intersection of plumbing. And this is where, this is where people that are, I, I guess, that are kind of new to pneumatics have a little trouble understanding exactly what you're supposed to do. And the bottom line is, as long as it's all connected, it doesn't matter how you plumb it, right? So how we typically do it is more, it's more like this, right? We run, we run because the tanks that we use, and I'll, we'll talk about that in a minute, they have a port at either end, right? They're, they're tubes and they have a port at either end, right? So we, we plumb a hose into one end, we just chain tanks together, right? We typically have three or four on the robot. We plumb them like this. We do that. And then we put a T in there somewhere. We put a T in there somewhere and, and run the release valve off the side. Okay. So that's more typically how we plumb the system. Okay. Um, but once again, as long as as long as it's all sharing a common volume, right, it doesn't really matter what order. I mean, we can put the release valve right by the compressor if we wanted to. this to simplify, but that's what you can do. So I'm going I'm to go back to the way that I've drawn it in the book, or in the handout, but um, I just want to make sure that that's understood, <coughs> is that I'm drawing things with nice square corners and tons of T's and Y's and things, and that's not necessarily how you have to plumb it. Okay, so there's a couple more components that we're required to have. So we are required to have what's called a pressure um, relief valve with an F, and the symbol for it's kind of weird. Okay. Um, gotta remember how to spell relief. Now what this does, 
just a little brass fitting. Basically, it's got a, a spring in it. It's got a, a, a mechanical, small mechanical valve in it. And basically, what it does is it's, a, it's got a knob and it's adjustable, which te puts tension on the spring, which keeps the valve closed. But when the pressure in this system gets above a certain point, it'll, it's able to push the spring out of the way and open the valve, and air is able to escape. Right until the pressure drops low enough that the spring can close the valve again. Right. So basically, this is an emergency thing. We, we can store up to 120 psi. We have to set this for like 125, right? So that so that if we over if 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 something gets stuck and the compressor keeps running and doesn't shut off when we reach 120 psi, this will open and let pressure out. Okay. So now, like I just said, the compressor has to shut off when we reach 120 psi. So we have what's called a pressure cutoff switch, which is a whole. Okay. Basically, um, the pressure cutoff switch is an electromechanical device, and what it does is it's a, it's a switch, it turns on or it turns an electric circuit on or off, but it, it operates at a certain pressure. So above a certain pressure, it'll close or open. I don't remember how they can be normally open or normally closed, depending on which one you get. I don't remember off the top of my head which way the one we use is, but basically. It either opens or closes the circuit based on if you're above a certain pressure. Okay, and basically that's used by the control system to detect when we're above a certain pressure and it shuts the compressor off. Okay. Um, now, the pressure cutoff switch, the pressure release valve, relief valve, um, those typically come from first. We don't typically buy those is when we, we start talking about COPS components later, we're not, not going to talk about where we get those because we don't buy them. We've got a bunch of them laying around. We get one from first typically every year, so we don't have to ever have to buy them because they kind of want you to use the specific model that they give you so that every team has the same hardware so that they know everybody's safe. So, but if, if you're working with on industrial components, you'll have to go out and figure out, you know, what pressure do you want to be able to relieve at, and, and you've got quite a bit more leeway to work with. But like I said, here we don't have a lot of freedom. Um, okay, so that's kind of it, right? That's everything we have to have, right? This 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 gives us a supply of 120 psi air to something that we need it for. Okay. However, there's one variation of this. Basically, the compressor is heavy. Like, oh, it's going to be more than five pounds for sure, right? It's also fairly large, especially the one we use, which is quite, quite large. Um, basically, if we can get that weight off the robot so that we, we fill up our air tanks before a match, we take the compressor off, and then we run the match, and then when we come back at the end of the match, we can fill it over there again. If we can do that, we would like to be able to. So we can change the plumbing so that we can change the plumbing so that we can take the compressor off. But there's a few things we're required to do. Okay, so first of all, we have to have a um, a quick disconnect. And a quick, quick disconnect in our case is a, is a push to connect fitting, just like all the other fittings we use. We'll talk about that in a little bit. But um, basically, it's, it's just something you can plug in and, and unplug easily without having to unscrew stuff and, and things. So, so some sort of a quick disconnect. Um, the, the important thing to note is that, I'm actually going to do this in the wrong place. The, the problem with the, the quick disconnects that we use and most teams use is that when you open it, right, so if you think about, um, have you ever used like a, like an impact gun or something where you hook it up to a compressor and it's got those fittings where you, you like snap the, you at the compressed air hoses together, you guys have ever used those connections where you kind of 
those don't leak, right? When you, when you unplug whatever tool you're using in that pneumatics hose, you, you don't have air spewing out the end of the hose, okay? That's because that fitting has a valve in it that when you don't have something plugged into it, it closes and doesn't let air escape. Well, the ones we use are really simple. They don't have any kind of a mechanism like that. So when we, um, when we unplug the compressor, right, we disconnect the compressor from the robot, all the air would escape. We've got to have some way of shutting that off before we disconnect the compressor, right? So what we typically do is we use, we use the release valve. We use the pressure release valve, right? And basically we put our quick disconnect on the end of the pressure release valve so that we can close the pressure release valve like we normally would. I mean, the pressure relief valve is going to be normally closed except in a case of emergencies. So what we do is we, we connect to the end of it, then we open it to fill it with air, to fill the system with air, then we close it before we disconnect the compressor so our air doesn't escape, okay? That's just so that we don't have to have two valves in the system. We, we, we just use a valve that's already there. Um, okay, so then from there, we can, we can connect that to the compressor. Right, that's pretty easy. Now, typically, we talked about that pressure relief valve. Um, typically, when you're, that, the only time you're gonna overpressurize your system and, and need a pressure relief valve is when you're running the compressor. So, and this is where I can't quite remember the way the rules worked last year and I didn't bother looking it up. But, um, the, and there was a change recently about this. I, if I remember correctly, the way it worked is you used to have to, if you had the compressor off board, you had to have a relief valve on the compressor and on the robot, if I remember correctly, which was a little weird. And they, they just changed it and I can't remember if they changed it so that it had to be on the robot or could only be on the compressor. I don't remember. So, so either in, your, in the diagram, in your handout, I have it so it's attached to the compressor and gets removed from the compressor. I don't remember if that's correct or not. Um, and, and it's possible that that might change in the future. That's one of the pneumatics rules that is probably more likely to change. Um, but basically, somewhere you still have to have um, your pressure relief valve either there or on the compressor, okay? Um, now, when we shut, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna run the compressor, right? This whole system from the compressor onwards is gonna be pressurized. Now, we shut this valve off and we need to disconnect this um, quick connect. But the problem is this volume from the valve to the compressor is still pressurized, okay? So we've gotta have a way getting that pressure out of there before we undo the, the quick disconnect because the quick disconnects are typically harder to undo when there's pressure in there. You don't want to have a blast of 120 PSI coming out of that hose. So um, a lot of you on FRC have probably done that and it makes a lot of noise and it's kind of obnoxious and it, it can damage your components if you do it a, a lot. So what we do is we add a, a second valve Okay, so that we can close this valve, open this valve to dump the pressure that's in this volume right here, then we're gonna do the quick disconnect. Um, so that's, that's how we typically plumb it, although a little more recently we found that we typically have better luck if we actually put the compressor on the robot permanently just because we tend to run out of air and we're not very good at checking for leaks. So our robot typically leaks like a sieve and then we don't fix it, we just put the seven pound compressor on the robot. Um, but if we don't have to wait for it, we don't have to wait for it, and we can't do that. So um, that's the point for that. Okay, so 120 PSI, this whole system 120 PSI. We're not allowed to use, we're allowed to store pressure at 120 PSI, we're not allowed to use pressure at 120 Why PSI. Not? Safety. So, so we're, we're allowed to use up to 60. Okay, so we've got a flow of air that's 120 psi, but we can only it can only be 60. Well, what do we do? Well, we use a pressure regulator, and a pressure regulator is a device. It is a device. No, really? Yeah. Go figure. Okay, 
pressure regulator is a, a device, and it's got a series of, it, it goes in line with the, the flow, right? So you, you pass air through it, right? It's a fairly large thing, typically. It's got a big knob on it, basically. Um, it has a series of, of springs and check valves, and you know, there's, there's a number of mechanical things in there. Basically, it operates kind of similar to the pressure relief valve, where you, when you tighten the knob down, it's basically compressing a spring, which makes it harder for a mechanical valve to, to open under pressure. And basically, the idea is it will allow air past as long as the pressure here is below a certain pressure, right? So, so if we set our regulator for the maximum, right, 60 PSI, you don't have to set it for 60 PSI, you can set it for lower than that if you want, and, and typically we do, because the lower pressure we're using here, the longer our tanks last, basically. So we want to use it the lowest pressure we can, because it, it means our air supply will last longer. But um, basically, as long as the pressure on this side is below whatever we have the regulator set at, it will allow air from this side to flow into this side. But this side, this side here is at a quite a bit of higher pressure, right? It's 120 PSI, it's only 60 or something over here, right? So basically, it just lets a little bit through, and then this, this side gets up to pressure, the valve closes it, doesn't let any more air come through until we use the air on this side, right, by, by doing something with it. Then, then that, then the, the pressure drops on this side. The, the valves inside the regulator open, and it lets more air come through until this side's back up to pressure. And that all happens really fast, right? I mean, it, it, it's a fairly high flow thing. So it's unless you're using a ton of air all in a rush, typically it can keep up and keep this side pressurized right at your your value. Um, although so that is something to consider if you're if you're designing something that has a lot of flow in it, you're using a pneumatic motor or something. Your, your pressure regulators and, and all of this stuff can constrict your flow enough that you can't, air can't flow through fast enough to maintain the pressure that you would like. So that's not an issue that we typically run into in FRC, but um, it is it is something to consider. Um, okay, so when we talk about what we're actually using, what we're actually using the air for, typically, we're using it for with with pneumatic cylinders, okay? Which is a, which is a, a type of piston. But if I do a cross section, just a really simplified representation. You've got a, a tube, right? It's got kind of a, a hole in one end. You've got a rod with a plunger on the back, and then basically you've got a port in the side of the air cylinder here, and a port in the side of the air cylinder there. If I, if I put compressed air in this side and I, and I just leave this side open to the atmosphere, it'll retract. If I put in air in this port and leave this port open to the atmosphere, it'll extend. Right? So it's, it's kind of a two position linear actuator. Right? You, you put in air one side, it extends all the way. You put in air the other side, it retracts all the way. It's pretty simple. There are a ton, there are a ton of different kinds of pneumatic actuators that are used in the industry. There's like there's rotary mechanisms. There's there's all kinds of weird kinds of cylinders. There's there's little grippers. There's all kinds of there's um one of the, my last job we used a, an escapement where it was kind of a, an actuator that would do this, and it was used to actuate little gates that would allow parts to pass through. It was a big complicated piece of equipment, um, and and it was you know so there's all kinds of there's just. I mean, if you can think of something, there's there's something out there for it that uses pneumatics. But in FRC, we're typically only using cylinders, and we're not getting particularly creative with the cylinders either, just because the larger, more complicated pneumatic actuators tend to be very, very heavy and very, very expensive. So air cylinders are cheap. They're pretty lightweight for what they are. I mean, they're still fairly heavy, but compared to other more complicated types of pneumatic actuators, they're, um, um, they're pretty much the only thing that's worth it in terms of weight. So um, basically, we have to use what's called a solenoid valve. Now, a solenoid is a word for a coil of wire. 
and that's what a solenoid is. A solenoid is an electromagnet. So essentially you've got a coil of wire, and then you put an armature in the middle, like an iron or steel armature, and then if you, you power the coil with direct current, it'll push the armature in one direction. And if you power the coil in the other direction, the armature will, will move in the other direction. Right? It's, a, it's a type of linear motor, effectively. Um, so that's what a solenoid is. So basically, a solenoid valve is a, is a type of valve that's actuated using a solenoid, right? So, so, so if you think of a manual valve, you're grabbing it with your hand and you're moving a lever or something to, to actuate the valve, right? Um, and that's what's typically called the operator of a valve, is, is the thing that moves it. The operator of a valve would be your hand and a handle, right? That would be the operator of a valve. Or the operator for a valve could be an electric motor. The operator for a valve, in this case, for a solenoid valve, is a solenoid. Now there's a little more that goes into it than that, but, but essentially there's a, what we call, they're typically called spool valve. They've got a, a cylindrical part inside and it's got a series of O-rings on it and that, that rod passes through a certain number of chambers and the, the rod has grooves in it and as it slides back and forth, it's basically bridging the gaps between different chambers and allowing air to flow between one chamber or the other. I'm not going to go into exactly what that looks like, but we're going to talk about the different kinds of valves here. So, um, all right, there, here, there, I'm going to get into some like nomenclature here, and it's going to be fairly confusing because there's a lot of terms that sound similar, and I'll try to point out what not to get confused about and what you're being confused about. But, um, this is what we're going to talk about during the season. So this is, you know, last week when I was talking about belts, I was talking about how we're going to throw around names during the season when we're doing the design process. Same thing here. We're going to talk about double acting, single acting, right? And you guys want to know what those names are so that when we're talking about it, you know, well, I think this will work for that. I don't, I don't think we should use that, right? And that, that'll be part of the discussion. So, okay. So basically, there, in, in the context of what we're doing, there are two kinds of valves that we're worried about. So it's like a normal valve, like, like one of these would be like a two-way valve, I guess you would call it, right? It's either open or closed, right? It's just, pa it's just a pass-through, right? Well, th there's two other kinds of valves we're concerned about. There's three-way valves and there's four-way valves. So a three-way valve is like a Y, maybe you can, you can think of it, right? Right? You can, you can your flow is coming in from here, and you can either switch it this way or, or that way. Now, in terms of in terms of solenoid valves, now now remember these are both being used for air cylinders. So so keep in mind these kinds of valves are being used for air cylinders. So with an air cylinder, I drew it earlier. Okay, you can have an air cylinder like this. Now, I'm not going to go into this <coughs> quite yet. Well, yeah, I did it in kind of a weird order in your handout, but I'm not going to do it that way. Okay, so we're going to, we're going to, we're going to talk about air cylinders here real quick. So the air cylinder I drew earlier is what's called a double acting air cylinder. Basically, you pressurize it in one direction and it extends, you pressurize in the other direction and it retracts. Okay, now the important thing to understand is I can't just have an open and closed valve on each one of these, right? I, I, I have to be able to let pressure back out, but I can't let pressure back out back into my, my stored pressure, right? I, I can't feed pressure back in because it just won't go. So basically, once I put pressure in the cylinder and then I want to go the other way, I let I just have to let that pressure back out into the atmosphere. Right? I just have to let it go. Okay? So we have to, that's what we call venting or exhausting the cylinder. Okay? Now we're gonna we'll come back to double acting. That this is double acting, right? You you power it's basically powered in both directions. 
Well, there's single acting cylinders, and basically single acting cylinders have one port, and they have a spring in them. So basically when I pressurize this, it'll, it'll extend the rod and it'll compress this spring. And then basically, if I vent the cylinder, the, the spring will, will push the cylinder back into its default position. Now, typically you're using these for, um, because they use less air, right? They use half as much air, right? Which is good because we've got a certain number of tanks on our robot. If we don't have our compressor on our robot, we don't want to run out of air. And even if we do have our compressor on the robot, we don't want the compressor to be running all the time to keep us filled up with air and draining our battery during the match. So, single acting cylinders are great. The, the thing is with single acting cylinders, right, this spring can only be so strong, right? In order to extend, right, the spring has to be soft enough that your air pressure can extend the, can extend the cylinder and compress the spring. So, typically, typically you use a single acting cylinder in a situation where you need a lot of pushing force but you don't need a lot of pulling force, right? Now, there are arrangements of cylinders where the spring's like on the other side, so you don't get much extending force, but you get a lot of retraction force. Those are very not common, but you can get them. Um, so this is, what's, this is what's called single acting spring return, and, the, and that other style would be single acting spring extend, but, but typically you're gonna see single acting spring return like nine out of 10 times. Why is it more popular? Um, that's kind of a hard question to answer. I mean, I, it just comes down to typically you, you, you care more about a pushing action than a pulling action. I, I don't know, I'm, I'm not sure I can answer that question okay. super specifically, but just typically you, you care more about pushing than pulling, I guess. Yeah. Um, I don't think we've ever actually used a single acting cylinder on a robot. Mm -hmm. I, I, when I was a student, we did use them for a couple things, because typically typically you care about, you need force in both directions, right? right? So, but, but typically in the situations where you only need force in one direction, it's like you're, you're pushing something or something, and, and then you just, you just gotta retract the mechanism, yeah. and, and you don't care much. Um, um, okay, so let, let's talk about single acting. Single acting cylinders use what's called a three-way valve, okay? Basically the way this works, is we actually kind of use it in reverse. So if I can, so we've got pressure coming in here, right? So that, let's, let's say that pressure comes in here. Okay, so we're using a solenoid to kind of actuate this back and forth. So we can either flip it to this side, pressure comes into the cylinder, the cylinder extends. Or we can flip it to this side, and that pressure leaves, right? And that's essentially what a three-way valve is, okay? Um, so three-way valve goes with the single acting cylinder, okay? Now, let's talk about, let's, let's talk about a little bit more specifics about that valve because it becomes important. That valve can either be double acting or single acting. Now, is that confusing? Yes, yes it is. Because we have double acting and single acting cylinders, right? We have double acting and single acting valves, and guess what? They don't have a single thing to do with each other. They, they, they don't, there's no correlation between the two at all, except you're using the same, you're using them together a lot. It's just a very, very confusing thing. But you've got double acting valves, single acting valves, you've got double acting cylinders and single acting cylinders, and they have not a thing to do with each other. You can use double acting valves on single acting cylinders, and you, know, you, you can do either one. You can, you can pair up any of the four possible ways. Um, Basically what it means is that now this is, like I said before, the way this actually works, and actually I'm gonna go into it here real quick. You've got what's called the work marker that's not working. You've got what's called the spool, which is just a, a cylinder of metal. And you've got some O-rings and you've got some chambers, right? This is a, a chamber, that's a chamber. Um, it's actually a more square, but and then you've got ports. I think so. Long. I think, yeah, I think they're usually square. But anyways, um, so basically, you, you're making a seal, right? These are O-rings. Right? You've got these two chambers, right? And you've got pressure coming in, and, and pressure can go <coughs> out. Um, actually, no, I did that all wrong. There's
Right, so essentially the way this works, right, is, is these three chambers are isolated from each other. If this is just a straight rod that goes through there, those three chambers can't, the air can't flow from one chamber to the next because you've got O-rings that are sealing around the spool, okay? Basically, there's grooves cut in the spool that allow air to go past the O-rings and, and flow to the next chamber. Okay. And if you take this spool and you push it to the other side, right, the grooves end up here, and, 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 and now you're letting air to come back from the cylinder and go out. Okay. So that's, that's what's called a spool valve. Most solenoid valves are spool, spool valves. Not all solenoid valves are spool valves, but the ones we use are. So that's, you know, I, I just wanted to clarify that, that there's no kind of rotational motion to it. That's not how it works. But the point is it shifts back and forth, okay? Now, a double acting solenoid valve has a solenoid at this end and a solenoid at the other end. Now, the way solenoids are wired, they really only work in one direction. They can work in two directions, but typically they're more efficient if they're wired, if they're wound in a certain way to only push, right, or only pull, okay? I don't actually know which way is better, but um, so essentially, you've got a solenoid that can push the spool this way. You got another solenoid at the other end to push the spool that way. You've got two sets of wires going to either side of the valve. You've got to turn turn one circuit on to put to put the valve in one position. You've got to turn that circuit back off and flip the other circuit back on to put the valve in the other position. Okay, so it's kind of like an either or kind of a thing. Now, that's called double act. That's a double acting valve, right? Basically, you've got two sets of wires going to it. You've got to turn it on and off. But the, the important thing is that if, 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 you, if you lose this power, right, if you, if you shut off the valve entirely and you're not powering it, the valve stays in its current position, right? So you, you basically, the way double acting valves work is you, you pulse it, right? You give it a pulse, it shoves the spool to the other side, and then the spool stays there, and, and you, you just turn it off and you let it sit there, right? So, um, Single acting valves, basically they, they work kind of like a single acting cylinder in some ways, where they've got a spring, right? They've got, they've got one solenoid at one end, the solenoid pushes the spool into a position and you've got to leave the solenoid on to hold the valve in one position. And when you shut the valve off or you cut power to the valve, the spring will push it back and it'll return to a default position. Right, so, and, and you just choose that based on what you want to happen when the valve loses power. So like at the end of the match our robot gets disabled, all the valves are going to lose power. So if we want if we want to prevent mechanisms from moving when that happens, we've got to be able to we've got to use a double acting valve. But double acting valves take twice as many wires, so and, and we're limited on the number of circuits we can run, so that's something to consider. Okay, so let's let's talk briefly about four way valves and then I want to move on to cot stuff and then get to cat. So four way valves kind of like three-way valves, except basically they do the same thing as, as, for a as this, except for a double acting cylinder. So you've got um, four-way valves have five ports. And solenoid valves are typically some sort of a rectangular block, kind of like this, like they're kind of rectangular. Basically you put pressure in this one and then you hook, you know, one side to one side of the cylinder, the other side to the other side of the cylinder, and then basically the chambers in here, right, there's, there's gonna be five chambers. The spool goes through all those, basically at either pressure, pressure either goes to this side, and this side vents out this port, or, or it's the other way, right, where where um, this vents to that port and pressure goes to this port. Does that make sense? Okay, and you really don't need to worry about the internal workings of that, just understanding that you've got five ports, one of them's a pressure, and then you've got a prep, you've got a supply and an exhaust for each side of your air cylinder, right? And then you use a three-way valve for a single acting cylinder. Okay, so four-way valves for double acting cylinders, three-way valves for single acting cylinders, and the valves themselves can either be double or single acting. Not simple, but that's how it works. 
Okay, so that's that's all I've got for the pneumatic circuits segment. This was very, very tailored to FRC. Um, obviously, when you're working with industrial pneumatic systems, you have a lot more stuff that you can use, but typically they just look something, they look something similar to this. Okay, so now that we've talked about all these wonderful things that you can do with pneumatics, let's look at what some of the stuff actually looks like, where to buy it, where to get CAD models, etc. So we're gonna we're gonna do our COTS page, which is the one that's got all the pretty pictures. Although they all kind of have pictures. Um, okay, so like I said earlier, a lot of this stuff, a lot of this stuff, like the really critical components, like the pressure release valve, pressure relief valve the pressure cutoff switch, that stuff is supplied to us by first, and so we don't really have to buy it. We could go out and buy it if we wanted to, but we've already got some, so we don't need to. So I'm gonna kinda just go over the stuff that we actually have to buy. I'm not gonna go over all the components. So we're gonna start with air cylinders, because obviously that's kind of the most important thing. We're gonna be buying a whole bunch of different air cylinders, because they come in different lengths and sizes. So when you're looking at an air cylinder, You've got two important parameters, essentially. Well, three, right? The first, there's different kinds of air cylinders, like the way they're specifically built. You, you want to know which kind you want. But, but outside <laughs> of that, there's two important parameters. There's stroke length and there's bore diameter. Now, what do you guys think stroke length is? Anybody hazard a guess at what stroke length? The length of the stroke. <laughs> Shocker. <laughs> Right, so the, the stroke length is the distance that the cylinder extends, right? It could be half an inch, could be four inches, could be 12 inches, right? You can buy them, you can buy all kinds of different stroke lengths. Typically, for English sizes, typically in like half inch increments. Right? You can buy like four and a half, five, five and a half, six, right? When you get the longer cylinders, they, they switch to one inch increments. Um, okay, so that's, that's, those are air cylinders. Bore, bore diameter is a little more complicated. Basically, it's how big around the cylinder is, which corresponds to how much surface area the piston head has inside the cylinder. And that corresponds to how much force is exerted for a given pressure. Right, so if the surface area of my piston is one square inch, right, whatever diameter that equates to. If it's one square inch and I'm running at 60 PSI, my my cylinder is going to exert 60 pounds of force, right? One square inch, 60 pounds per square inch, 60 pounds of force, okay? But if I get a cylinder that's a bigger diameter that has, say, three square inches of piston head surface area, and I'm still running at 60 PSI, right? Then I'll have 180 pounds of force, okay? So bore diameter equates to, to Force. Now it uses more air, right? Because it's a larger volume that it's displacing. Right? You're using more air, but you're getting more force out of one cylinder. So we'll have to we'll go into that. I mean, in the season, we'll have to select what we want based on the the torque requirements of our mechanisms and stuff. But but that's pretty much what goes into it. So there's there's essentially two different styles of air cylinders that we're going to use. So if you go to McMaster Car, you can search air cylinders, these round body air cylinders here. These first two are the ones we're interested in. There's double acting and single acting, right? We talked about that. Which one has the spring in it? Single. Single, right? We're probably going to use double acting. We typically use double acting, but if we find an application that single acting will work for, we'll use single acting. Um, so then basically over here we can pick our stroke length, you know, say four inches. We can pick our bore size, one and a sixteenth is the size we use quite a bit. It's pretty, you know, mid-range force. You can see here there's um, there's two kinds there's two kinds of mounts. We've got this universal mount and we've got this nose mount. So this cylinder here, this little graphic right here, this is what nose mount, right? It's got a threaded boss on the front of the cylinder and this nut screws down. So basically you, you put a hole in something, 
you'd stick the cylinder through the hole and you'd tighten the nut down on it, right? And the cylinder can't turn or anything, it's just mounted flat to whatever bracket has the hole in it, right? The pivot mount, or what they, what McMaster Carr calls universal mount, pretty much everybody else calls it pivot, pivot mount, but they call it universal mount. Basically, it's also got a threaded boss on the front, but it's also got this, this thing on the back where you remove this nut and basically there's a, a hole through this little stud and basically you can, you can mount it, you can put a pin through the back of the <coughs> cylinder and the cylinder can, can pivot if it needs to. Okay? Um, and you can see down here, they sell little brackets where you can put the pin through the back of the cylinder and bolt this bracket to something. And then, and then if you're doing something with a rotary mechanism where the, the cylinder needs to change angle as it's going through its stroke, it can pivot around the back. We, we use those a lot. They have CAD models available. We're going to be downloading one a little bit later. Okay, this is what's called a round body stainless steel air cylinder. Okay, this center portion here is stainless steel. This part here and this part here, those are, those are machined aluminum, but this part in the middle is stainless steel. Basically, this is the cheapest variety of air cylinder you can get. The reason it's cheap is because for a given bore diameter, this middle portion is just a piece of seamless stainless steel tube that when the manufacturer has, they cut it to length and they basically just crimp, they basically just crimp these two end caps on. Right? It's a really, really cheap manufacturing process. So they can make they can make cylinders of a whole bunch of different lengths without having to machine the different parts, right? They just have to cut a tube to length and basically crimp it together. Right? So that's a very cheap manufacturing process. They can make these cylinders really cheaply. Um, the problem with it, they can't be disassembled, so if you screw something up and you bend it or you damage it or the O-rings fail, you just throw the cylinder away and buy a new one. But they're cheap enough that's simply not that big of a deal. There are other types of air cylinders though. So if we go back to air cylinders, we can go to tie rod air cylinders. The ones we typically, there's all kinds, there's ones that are square. We typically use these round ones. I don't remember why that is really, but we use the round ones. We have a couple of these, but typically we use the other style. But these are, these are more compact. Um, they're, t they're, they're, they're called tie rod air cylinders because they use these rods. And basically the rods are threaded and the thing all bolts together. The whole air cylinder bolts together, right? So if you need to replace O-rings or replace some component, you can take the air cylinder apart, clean it if you need to. These are typically used in industrial environments more than the other ones. The um, tie rod air cylinders are heavier, a lot more expensive, but they can be taken apart and maintained. So, you know, the price of buying a more expensive air cylinder might pay off in the long run if you can repair it. Um, but for us, we typically prefer the other ones because they tend to be lighter. They're obviously a lot cheaper. Um, the, the, the added advantage of the tie rod air cylinders is for a given stroke length, I right, want one inch of stroke for a stainless steel round body air cylinder. One inch stroke cylinder is still four inches long. I mean, the cylinder is fairly large, even though it only has like one inch of stroke. Okay. Well, a compact tie rod air cylinder, they're designed to be shorter overall length for a given stroke length. So if I want a one inch stroke length, this cylinder is going to be a lot smaller for a one inch stroke than a round body stainless steel air cylinder will. And that just has to do with the design, okay? So if we were really cramped on space, we're gonna use one of these. Um, if we're not, then we'll, we'll try to use one of the other styles. Those are the two styles that we use. There are other kinds. If you wanna go on McMaster Car and, and browse around, you can. This company here, Automation Direct, also sells air cylinders as well. They sell pretty much the same products as McMaster Car does. Um, like I mentioned, there are little brackets. The most important one that I want you to note is down here at the bottom is this here. You see this little guy right here on the end? Basically, the, the, the end of these cylinders are threaded, right? It's just a round rod with threads on the end. Basically, you buy this little bracket. It's called a clevis. We're going to put a clevis on every single air cylinder we use, most likely. So when, when, you're, when you're doing CAD, you'll have to download CAD models of the clevises. We'll buy the clevises, they're just a few bucks. And we, you thread them on the end of the air cylinder, you, you tighten it down with a nut, right, to keep them from spinning off. And that's how 
you could put a pin through the end, and that's how you attach the air cylinder to something that you want to actuate. Okay, so clevises are pretty important. These little foot brackets, you can buy these, but typically we, because we're, we're doing stuff with sheet metal, we're just integrating this shape into some other structural part. So we're not typically buying them, we're typically kind of making our own, but we would be the same kind of concept, basically. Um, okay, so that's, that's air cylinders. Now, let's talk about fittings. I'm gonna go to Automation Direct um, Pneumatics Components. There's two kinds. There's, there's push to connect NPT fittings. Basically, NPT are, are metal pipe threads that you use for pressurizing stuff. They're basically, the threads are tapered, so that when you tighten them into something, they, they make a seal. Okay? And you usually use some sort of a, a sealing compound to help that along. But basically, they're special threads for, for pressurized things. So basically, we can buy these fittings, and they have these little they have these little, you see this little plastic ring on here? Basically, you, you shove a piece of tubing in here, we'll talk about the tubing in a second, but you shove a piece of tubing in here, and it's got little teeth that grab on to the tube and hold the tube in place and make a seal, right? So you gotta just take the tube, you, you shove it in, in the fitting firmly, this is called a push to connect fitting, because you, you just push the tube into it and, and your connection's done, right? Um, then, if you want to take the tubing back out, you, you basically take your fingers or some sort of little bracket and you basically push in on that flange that releases the teeth, which let go of the tubing and pull the tube out. Okay? These are really, really easy because you can just connect stuff up and as you'll see in a second when you combine it with the tubing, it's just really, really fast uh, for plumbing. I um, used to work on some more used to work uh, for a company that, that built industrial equipment and for some of the stuff we did we would we would run cop hard copper tubing to make pneumatics connections because they, they lasted longer and basically you'd have to bend the copper and you'd have to put these little fittings on the end and it was a lot of work whereas using these you can just kind of plug things in and everything's happy so there's there's ones like this that are threaded and the, the whole point of the threaded ones is the threaded you need the threaded fittings to basically fit into a valve. Valves have threaded holes in them. Air cylinders have threaded holes in them. Regulators have threaded holes in them. So typically, every place that we're like connecting something, well, the tanks are different, but everywhere we're like we're making connections to components. You know, the, the ports of the air cylinders, all these ports of the valves, those are all threaded in, right? So we we gotta buy the threaded fittings. We have got a whole bunch of these upstairs, but typically every year we, we buy a few extra just to replace ones that, that got messed up or uh, improve our stock. But there's also these push to connect union fittings, which are, they just, they're all push to connect, right? So you can, you have like T's and crosses and, and unions and, and all this wide stuff. And, and so you can use this for creating like branches in, in the middle of your, your circuit. Now, this is used with the, used with um, polyurethane tubing. Now, it comes in a roll. We're typically using quarter inch, but, but 530 seconds is also a fairly common size. Um, basically, it's, it's fairly flexible, right? It's, it's sturdy enough, it's not rubber, right? It's, not, it's sturdy enough that it can handle 150 PSI, typically. Um, but it, it's soft enough that it's flexible so if we've got some mechanism on our robot that moves, the, the tubing can, can move with the, the moving mechanism, right? It's also flexible enough we can kind of fish it through tight spaces and route it around things if we need to. And then it's really easy to cut, right? So it just comes in a roll. It just comes in a roll. There's a picture of a roll on your handout. It just comes in a roll. You can cut it with, with like special tubing cutters. You can even cut it with scissors if you need to. Um, you just want to cut the end nice and square, and then you just push it into the push to connect fittings, and you have a you have a good seal. So we use that for the majority of our pneumatics connections if we can. Now I mentioned before I didn't include it in the diagram because I figured I didn't really need to, but but we've we've got some gauges, right? We we have a gauge somewhere in here to tell us what our stored pressure is, and we typically have a gauge either on or right after the regulator to tell us. 
you know, what the pressure is after our regulator. Now, typically regulators have gauges built into them, but, you know, depends. Now, we get regulators in the kit of parts, so we've been using those, but they're pretty heavy. They're large and pretty heavy. There's a product that Automation Direct has. I've known about it for a while, but haven't really bothered to buy them because we already had regulators, but we're going to try to make a switch to these next year if we can. Basically, they're, instead of these giant bulky aluminum blocks that are our regulator that weigh a couple of pounds, basically, and they have threaded fittings and that adds weight and everything, um, Automation Direct has these like really, really tiny pressure regulators and, and these little valves and they, they're molded onto plastic fittings with push to connect fittings in them, right? So you just plug the hose right in and it's just like this tiny little regulator that's like this big and it weighs nothing and it doesn't take up any space. Um, so a lot of teams are starting to use these. They're really cheap. I mean, they're really no more expensive than a normal regulator. Um, so we're gonna try to start using these, but, but they save a lot of space and they can save you a pound or more weight on your robot just by changing which regulator you're using. So uh, that's pretty significant. Um, pretty much all FRC teams are using the same air tanks Basically, they're these black clippered air tanks. They're plastic, so they're really lightweight. In FRC, we used to use big aluminum tanks, and they weighed like a million pounds, and they didn't hold that much air because they weren't that big, and it was just a whole nightmare. And then when these plastic tanks came out, everybody got excited, and everybody's happy now because they're plastic tanks. Basically, we used to use these white plastic tanks. They've got a threaded fitting in the end, but people are idiots, and they over-tighten them, and they would crack the tank, and then the tank would explode. <laughs> And so people were like, oh, the tanks aren't safe. It really was just people weren't safe because they didn't know how to not over tighten stuff. But they made them illegal at first, but these other tanks were out there, which are like no more expensive, so nobody really cared. Um, they've got push to connect fittings in the end, so you don't have to be screwing stuff together. You can just shove the tube in the end and, and you're, you're good to go. So pretty much everybody uses these tanks. They're, they're really great. They're not that expensive. They hold a lot of air and they don't weigh hardly anything. Um, solenoid valves, we also buy solenoid valves from um, Automation Direct. Not a lot of teams use Automation Direct valves, but they're starting to become more and more popular. Um, I've got some links in your book. Uh, the links, Automation Direct links are really long, so they wouldn't fit in the page. So if you want to access the links that are in the handout, you're going to have to go in the Google Drive version to actually be able to click on them. Um, the uh, uh, the links for stuff other than Automation Direct, you can just type it in if you really want to off your piece of paper, but who does that? But you can see right here, we got like five two-way valves. The one that's pictured is a double acting valve because it's got the solenoid on either side. Um, this is really the only component in pneumatics that we don't, that we're trading off weight on. Automation Direct valves are dirt cheap. I mean, they're like, 20, 25 bucks, right? 30 bucks maybe for some of the larger ones. Solenoid valves are expensive. <coughs> Festo, Festo is a like name brand, like top of the line pneumatics component supplier. I mean, Festo is like the best of the best in terms of pneumatic stuff. They're very, very, very expensive, right? 80, 90, 100 bucks for a single valve, right? Whereas Automation Direct, you know, 20, 30. Um, however, Automation Direct valves are like three times the size of Festo valves, right? So we're trading off weight for price, but the price difference is so huge that we're just kind of eating that because this is just a better option and because we're not super rich. That's where we're at. So, so we, use, we do use these valves. They're larger and heavier than most of the other ones out there, but uh, they're easy to wire. Um, the Festo valves require special connectors. You basically got to buy plugs and then solder leads onto them. They're, they're obnoxious. I don't know why, but they're, they're obnoxious. Whereas these just have like little screw terminals and you can put the connectors together. So free. Those are valves you can buy three way, four way, double acting, single acting. The single acting ones look like this, where they've only got a solenoid on one side, they just kind of got a cap on the other. The double acting ones look like this, where they've got solenoids on either side. Um, we use both styles. We've got bunch of them upstairs. Okay, that is pneumatics components.
we are going to move on to our CAD. So what we're going to do, so last week was week eight. This is week nine. And it's a 16-week class. So we're, we're, today is the, the first week of the second half of the class. Okay, we've got eight, eight more weeks, including this week. Um, so basically, we've learned a good portion of the CAD that I'm going to teach you guys in terms of inventor skills. Using what we've learned so far, you've got the basics. Right? There's not a lot more that goes into it. There are more complicated things. There are different ways to do different stuff. There's methods, but based on the time we've got, um, you guys will figure some of that out, out on your own. Now, there's, there's one more thing that we're going to learn in CAD. We're not going to do it tonight. We're going to kind of leave it more towards the end. We're going to learn how to do drawings, which is where we can create schematics. I'll teach you guys how to do exploded views. So if you want to take an assembly and kind of explode it out and have a little tracer lines. Um, I want to use some of that during the season. It's pretty easy. But, um, but that's something that you know you need to be able to do because um, we'll have to make drawings and, and give them to the people who are making the parts and they'll use the schematics and stuff. So um, that, that's what we're going to learn a little bit. We've got two weeks where we're going to kind of talk about that kind of stuff. There's some other stuff that goes into it that we'll, we'll talk about. We'll talk about like exporting files for the laser and like to actually do stuff like that. Um, um, that's going to be, I'll look at the schedule, but, but anyway, that, that's a little, little later on. But basically we've got three, three two-week projects. We've got six weeks, so two weeks of that is going to be that drawing stuff. And then we've got three two-week projects that we're going to do. So this week and next week, we're going to do something with pneumatics. We're going we're gonna to model a simple, we're going to de de design, I'll show you how to do the layout sketch, and you're going to design a uh, like, rotational pneumatic joint using an air cylinder. Okay? We do that. We haven't, we haven't built a robot that we haven't done that on, right? I mean, we're going to do it every year. So you guys need to be able to do that quickly and, and design it on your own. So, um, so why don't we just have parts state? Because um, they're all slightly different. Okay. Like they're just, okay. you know, we're, we're kind of <coughs> building it into whatever mechanism it's attached to, and there'll be slightly different angles, and we'll need yeah, So, um, and they're pretty easy to design. We've got air cylinders. Right, we've got the cat model, the air cylinders laying around, but the actual thing itself is fairly. But you're, you're always going to do it kind of the same way, so I'll show you how to do that. Um, so we're, we're going to do that over the next two weeks, and then um, later we're going to work on a, we're going to talk about gearboxes and motors, and we're going to do kind of a, a gearbox and a motor set up to drive a roller, right, which is another thing we're going to do. Right, we, we designed a, a gearbox before, but we're going to use, for this we're going to use like off-the-shelf stuff. And, so that's going to be a project. And then we're also going to kind of go into learning how to design the frame of a drivetrain, because that's going to be the first thing we do in the season, is design a frame. So, um, but that's later. So we're going to start working on air cylinders. Uh, I'm going to do the same thing this time. I'm going to do, I don't know if we're going to be able to finish this. This is similar in complexity to the gearbox. Um, so we're going to do as much as we can in the class. But before next week, I'm going to record videos. Um, or, or after next week, maybe, but but I'm gonna record video. So if you guys need to finish it at home, I'll, we'll have the same kind of recorded thing as as you had before. So are you, um, gonna, are you gonna do that with all the projects? I am gonna do that with all the projects. Okay. Yep, that's the plan. That works pretty well. So yes. yeah, really good. okay, so um, the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna go get an air cylinder model. Now, normally when we were doing this during the season, we would want to know, okay. We've got a mechanism, right? We want to actuate it up and down. How much force does that mechanism have to have? How much does it weigh? How much torque does it take to lift that mechanism? Right? We're going to do all that math, right? I'm not going to mess with that here. I already showed you guys how to do that. I don't didn't want to go to the work to set up a complicated example where we had to work through all that stuff. So we're just going to just pick an air cylinder, just tell you what air cylinder to use. We're just going to design a thing to rotate using that air cylinder. So go to Chrome. Go to quickmaster.com. Okay. In the search box, type in air cylinders and it should fill in. Go to air cylinders. We're going to use the, uh, the round body air cylinders, which is this first one up in the corner here. 
everybody following along? I don't want to yeah. get ahead of everybody. Yeah. Okay, so we're gonna we're gonna use double action. It doesn't particularly matter for this example. But uh, under stroke length, let's do four inches. We're gonna use the same one that I, I picked earlier. Four inches and then one of the sixteenth bore size. Now quickly. So this cylinder at 60 PSI, this cylinder will have about 53 pounds of force. So the one that we've got, so the, the one and a 16 core diameter. That's, it's, force is independent of, of stroke length. But, so this, this is a size of cylinder that we use a lot, right? What? Um, 50 pounds of force is, is pretty good. You need help, Austin? What? You need help? This just looks different than mine. <laughs> okay. All right, so what we're going to do is we're going to use the universal mount because we want that little like pivoting joint at the back. So click on the part number here. Go to where it says product detail. Right where my mouse is. Go there and then scroll down. And depending on your screen resolution, this will show up differently, but scroll until you can see the schematic. Go to where it says 3D something. Go down, 3D step, just like we did before, yeah. and then save it, download it. Okay, now in my, now you guys are gonna need your thumb drives for this. If you didn't bring your thumb drives, your hose, once again. Thumb drive, like just, thumb drive. You're not gonna be able to save your work if you don't bring your thumb drive. So, um, I mean, you can save it on the computer, and if you sit at the same computer next week, you'll be able to have it, but good luck. Um, so in, Yes. Which one do we click in? Helpers, you want to help him? Yeah. Coulter and Andrew work for downloading models from a cache. I've got some people having trouble with it. Um, are you using Chrome? Yeah. Yeah, I don't know what size to click. So I thought that I'm having a problem. Mm -hmm. Folder, you got it. It's just what size do we click? It's a four inch stroke and a one and a sixteen core diameter. But when I double click it, it says include it. Right, just don't worry about it. Basically, you basically it thinks it's a different file than it is. So just you'll have to you'll have to go into Inventor and open it. This is the same thing. Once it's downloaded, right click on your show folder. Right click on it, click show in folder. Right click. Okay, I created a folder in my Stellar CAD class folder on my thumb drive called Rheumatic Joint. That's just what I call this project because I'm really not creative and couldn't think of a better name. So that's what I'm calling it. What did you call it? Rheumatic Joint. <laughs> What's the bore size again? One out of 16. All right. Everybody good? Everybody got that downloaded? Okay, go. Um, all right, so basically, you find it in your downloads folder, right click on it, cut it out of there, and, and put it in your pneumatic joint folder. Right? You're going to want to make a folder for this project because there's going to be a dozen parts or something for it, so just try to keep it organized. Typically, during the season, we'll have a folder for each mechanism on the robots. We'll have like 
a folder for the drivetrain, but like a folder for um, you know the arm, we'll have a folder for the elevator, right? We'll just we'll have a different folder for each mechanism, basically. That's how we keep our files organized. Okay, once you've got that done, go back to McMaster Car and click back once. Down here, somewhere underneath, it'll say Rod Clevis with pin. Right? Make make sure you still have the stroke length of four and the bore size of one and a sixteen. And then click on click on the part number, go to product detail, and download a step file for this as well. It's called the Rod Clevis with pin. That is correct. Rod Clevis with pin. And you'll you'll cut that out once it's downloaded. Go ahead and put it in the same folder as the air cylinder. Um, now, a little confusion. They are named the same thing, which is really freaking obnoxious. Yeah, the part number is different. But I want to know. So I'm just going to read <coughs> my file, and I'm just going to put Clevis on the end, so I know which one it is, um, because I want to know. <laughs> I'm not going to worry about during the season. We've got a specific way of naming it in the in the video. I in the video I named this stuff correctly, um, and I'll do that again. But I'm not going to do it here because we don't have a lot of time. Does everybody have two step files on their thumb drive in a folder designated for this project? No. Yes. I heard some no's, but a lot of yeses. So we'll give you a couple more minutes, and then we'll. Move on. Oh, oh, what's it called? Yeah. I don't need help. Okay, yeah. I'm a big boy. I'm a, I'm a girl. Yeah, you want to go? You actually have to go. I'm a girl in this first. Then go ahead and pick up your stroke plan. I'm good. 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 Um, basically, the way they have it set up is it's like an accessory for that cylinder. So when you pick the right air cylinder, it'll show up. Okay. Everybody got that? Okay. All right. So go to Inventor. Make sure your make sure your Stellar CAD class project is activated. Coulter and Andrew, you might want to just both go stand by. <laughs> <laughs> okay. No, so we're gonna go. We're gonna go to open. Yeah. We're gonna go to our pneumatic joint folder that we saved our stuff in. We're gonna go down to files of type and go to all files, right, so that we can actually see the step files. We're gonna open our air cylinder. Now, if you didn't rename yours like I did, you should look at the part numbers. The actual number at the front, the one that ends in K430, that's the clevis. Make sure you name it as such so you know which one is which. I just put clevis on it. Right, that's um, So pick the one that's the air cylinder and open that. Go ahead and go through the import process. Click OK when the dialog comes up. If it ever will. Come on. Now, it's got that random sketch in there, like usual. Just delete that out. Okay, so it comes in a little weird. This is not an assembly. Right? This is this is a part, right? It's a solid part. So it's in, in real life, this cylinder moves, right? It, it extends and retracts, okay? The CAD model doesn't do that, right? The CAD model is modeled with, it's got the rod in a retracted position, which you'll see in a second, and it's got the rod in the extended position. You can kind of like hide and show different geometry, 
right? And that will that will you can so you can you can show it in the extended position, show it in the retracted position. This is what's called a multi-body part. Um, I I really haven't touched on it a whole lot. I, I don't know if I will. This is easy to do and better, but we haven't really gone through a whole lot. So. We're gonna we're gonna kind of doctor this up. We're gonna get it ready to go, and then we're gonna save it, and we're gonna go import our clevis. So we're gonna first of all we're gonna set the material to stainless steel because this is a stainless steel air cylinder. It's got a lot of aluminum on it, but I'm not particularly worried about having an accurate weight from this. Okay, um, now I want to show. Have we got the material change? What was the material again? Stainless steel. I want to show this. What? Yeah, that the that, that appearance. Um, I want to show the cylinder in the retracted position. So if we go up to here, third uh, third line down from the top in the browser where my mouse is, where it says solid bodies and parentheses five, click the arrow, drop down that list, and if you hover over each item in the list, you can see what part it is in the actual part in, in the actual viewport. So for on my system, it's the second one from the top. I, I think. It might import the same way on every system. It might not import the same way on every system. I'm not yeah, 100% sure. Just, uh, but for me, it's the second one from the top. It's this one where the, kind of the end highlights. Right click on that and uncheck visibility. Oh, you, 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 down, 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 down. So just go back and do the same thing except download it to the universe. There's, there's two. They'll be like side by side. One over here. One knows about one. Oh, you have to click your stainless steel. Okay. So everybody do that. Everybody got that hidden so now your air cylinder looks like mine. Under solid bodies, right here where my mouse is. Uh, and I just found the one that was that. And I right clicked on it and unchecked it. Now, in a lot of cases, we're not going to use this nut on the back. And that should be a part separate by itself. Yeah, it's this one here, so we're going to hide that one as well. We're not going to use the nut on the front of the cylinder either, so I'm going to hide that one, which is the first one in the list. All right, so this is, this is what our cylinder will actually look like. Okay. Now I want I want a couple of work I want a couple pieces of work geometry. So we're gonna we're gonna put some work axes in this to make this easier to assemble later. Okay. So we're going to put one right down the length of the cylinder. So if we just click on axis, which is right smack in the middle at the top of the 3D model tab, click on axis, and just click on the center barrel of the cylinder, right? It'll put a work axis okay. through the center of the cylinder. And then we've got this like little hole in the back that the cylinder pivots from. I want a work axis in that as well. Helpers, you should be watching to make sure everybody gets what they're supposed to get. Okay, so if we click Axis again, we go inside this <coughs> cylindrical hole here at the back of the cylinder and click. Now we've got a second work axis. You should have what I have on my screen. So. Yeah. Where was that second work axis? Oh, it's I... back here at the back of the cylinder where this little okay. hole is. Okay. Finally on track here. Like, you, you probably just like you, 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 you,
you get to go versus wild type. Go to all so much. Uh, it's all the steel. Yeah. 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 Okay, we're going to move on here. Open the clevis next. So go to open, pick the clevis. Open. Click OK on the dialog. Delete the sketch. We're going to set the material to steel. And I, these are zinc plated, so I like to set the appearance to zinc. But that's optional, it's just because I like it to look pretty. Nice. Yeah, so we're doing renders of the robot. two threaded things and you put them on a shaft and you tighten them against each other, they, they tend not to loosen up. So that's what this is. Basically, you, you, you thread the nut on, you thread the clevis on, and you tighten them against each other so that they can't loosen up. Um, it just helps lock the clevis in place, otherwise it would vibrate loose and come off. Come off, come off. So, okay. Everybody got those two work axes? Yes, sir. And actually, you should you should save both of these. Make sure make sure you save them.
watching for people because um, I got to move on and you're going to have to help them get caught up. Okay, we're going to start an assembly. We're going to put these two, we're going to put these two things in an assembly. So, create a new standard assembly, click create. If you don't know how to do that at this point, I can't help you. Coulter can help you, but all right, so what we're going to do is we're going to right click, place component, go to our pneumatic joint folder, pick our air cylinder, we're going to open, we're just going to right click and place grounded at origin. by the y axis because we want we want the hole for the clevis we want it to be running the same direction as this pin at the end of the cylinder and once you're done with that once you've rotated it just place one down kind of out in the middle of space and then get it just escape Now we're going to use this assembly later. We're not going to mess with it this week in terms of what it's actually going to be used for. We're, we're going to do. We're going to make it. We're going to take some measurements and we're going to do our layout sketches. And that's kind of what I want to get done today. So, oh, it's there. So go to constraint. Click on the um, work axis that's in the bottom of the um, clevis, and constrain that to the center line of the cylinder. And then click apply. Okay, now what we want to do is we want to align the bottom of this nut with the end of the threads right here. And that's a bit of a tricky thing to do. So 
what we're going to do is we're going to click the bottom of the nut, and then we're going to find this, this arc right here. When you pick an arc or, a, or an actual circle in, in the constraint tool, it'll show this like ring with the green dot in the middle. You guys see the green dot? Or, or right here, you see the green dot? Basically, it's selecting a center point. So we're going to constrain a face, right? The, we're going to constrain the bottom of the nut. We're going to constrain this flat face at the end of the nut. We're going to constrain that to this point right here. And so basically, it'll align the back of the nut with right at the end of the threads. And that, that's kind of how you would you would thread that on as pretty much as far as you can go. And right? that's how you would, you would assemble this. And then click, once you're done, click apply. Now we have one degree of freedom, right? The the clevis can still rotate. It can't move in and out, can't translate around, but it can rotate. We're gonna fix that here in a minute once you guys get where you need to go. You guys need me to do that again? Yes, please. It's it's this one right here. Right the flat and this conical surface is this arc. So, yeah, these models, you gotta get used to where you can pick stuff on these models because the threads make things complicated. So if I, if I do this, I can just go to constraint, I pick the back of the nut, and then I, you gotta get an angle where you can get at it. Zoom in, and you pick that right there. You wanna, you wanna wait until you see, if you're picking this space here, it's just gonna be a flat surface. Actually, I guess you can put that. Actually, this flat surface works. I didn't even realize that was there. So yeah, you can do this as well.
face of the face of it. Zoom in. Zoom in. Zoom in. Zoom in. Zoom in. Zoom in. Select on that. Yeah. Make yeah. That face. That face. Yes. Okay, all of this, all of this was to get one dimension. Okay, we, we can we can go to we can figure this out using the, the data sheets that that McMaster Car had, but I wanted to show you guys it visually so it actually makes sense. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to use the measure tool. You guys don't need to do this, but you can if you want. I, I'm just hitting the M key to, to turn the dimension tool on, or the measure tool on. I'm clicking the construction, um, or I should say construction, I say work geometry, the, the work axis at the back of the cylinder. Not the one that goes through the middle, but the one that goes across. And then I'm clicking the, the work axis that goes across the clevis. <sighs> And it should say 9.02 inches. If it doesn't, you messed up. It says it in this little dialog box, but it also shows the dimension. It was the, the axis in the back of the cylinder and the axis that goes through the So make sure you save this assembly in your pneumatic joint folder. I'm just going to call it air cylinder assembly or something. There you go. Okay, so I'm going to I'm going to do a little drawing here. Okay, here's what we're going to do. Here's our example. We're going to do a layout here, sketch here. We've got like 20 minutes. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to draw what we're going to do first so it makes sense to you guys more intuitively. We have a mechanism, right? For this, these blue lines that I'm drawing are kind of representative <coughs> of the structure that we're going to do next week. Um, we're going to have a pivot point here, right? It could be a bearing, it could be a bushing. I haven't quite decided exactly what we're going to do yet. I think it's going to be a bushing. Right, so this is the center point of the pivot. This is the center point of the pivot of the cylinder. Right, this is all going to be structure and bracketry, this, those, those lines, right? But the important thing is we've got a center point, we've got a center point, and those are in relation to each other. Now, we've got some big mechanism that's on top of this that's got a pivot. We want it to pivot 90 degrees, okay? Just, that's what we want it to pivot, okay? So in order to pivot something, we've got to have a lever attached to that thing. Now in this particular case, we're not gonna, I don't care about what the mechanism is. We're probably just gonna make a little like stick or something that just something that indicate that we're moving up and down in, in our example, but I don't particularly care what it is. What we care about is the lever arm that attaches to the cylinder, right? So if we have our lever, it's got to go to the center of this clevis, okay? Now this has got to actuate, the cylinder is going to extend, right? And it's going to push this and it's going to rotate, right? Until it's, you know, 90 degrees, right? Then, and then, you know, what this lever actually looks like mechanically for the moment is not important, right? It's going to be a bracket, it's going to have a hole in it, it's going to attach to whatever we want to move, right? So if we've got a, a piece of metal that looks like this and we want it to rotate 90 degrees, you know, we can put a bracket that comes off of it like that and that's how we attach it, right? Right, or, or if, you know, this metal, piece of metal could look something completely different. I mean, this piece of metal could be down here and we'd, we'd put a, a bracket that would come off and, you know, look something like that maybe, right? 
to, but you guys see how you guys see how these lines kind of represent the important geometry, and then what the actual mechanism looks like is kind of irrelevant at the moment. Right? We'll deal with that next week. We'll model these brackets. I think we'll probably do something like this. But um, so what we're going to do is we're going to do a sketch. We're going to do a layout sketch. We're going to represent this in the layout sketch to figure out the exact dimensions of everything that needs to work. Okay. So we know that when the cylinder is ex is retracted, and actually, I guess I better erase this. We know that the we've got this point back here, and we have the point at which the cylinder attached up here. You guys remember? Yeah. We know the distance between those two points. That was that 9.020 that we just measured. Okay. We know the stroke of the cylinder. That's four inches. So we know that when the cylinder is extended, those two points are going to get four inches apart, farther apart from each other. So it'll go from 9.02 inches to 13.02 inches. We're going to use that. So start a new part. Yep, it's a standard part. Okay. So I'm going to start with a line. Start with the <coughs> origin. I'm going to go horizontal to the right. Just place it down and hit enter. I'm going to go from the origin up, and I'm going to make this line 1.5 inches long. Do you have no dimension? Okay. I press enter. So I've got a 1.5. Okay. Right, that's from the origin. So 1.5 inches up from the origin, a horizontal line that has no dimension. And then from the end of the horizontal line up, we're going to do 2 inches. Now, I, I have not done this whole thing. I haven't modeled this to the completion yet. I thought about doing it, but we didn't need it for this class, so I didn't bother. So this stuff might change in the future, but this is what we're going to do for now. Basically, this bottom line represents whatever surface that this thing is mounting to. It could be our drag train. It could be, some, it could be a piece of tubing. It could be a sheet metal part. Basically, this is... This is the base that this whole mechanism is attaching to. And these risers basically are the brackets that are sticking up to give us clearance for whatever we need, right? And then these dimensions are gonna depend on solely on what the mechanism is and what you're attaching to and how you're attaching. But we're just kind of throwing some numbers out there to help. All right, everybody got what I have on my screen? You should be able to move the two inch line back and forth and the, the line at the bottom should get longer and shorter. Right at the end of the horizontal <laughs> line. Hey, Colter, Andrew. You Why did you leave? <laughs> okay, so now we're going to draw a line from the top of the two inch line, just kind of out at an angle. Don't attach to anything. Make sure it's not horizontal. Make sure it's not vertical. Make sure it's just kind of out at an angle. Type in 0 0.9.020. Yeah. Now, what does that line represent? Uh, 9.020. So this represents the distance from the back pivot of the air cylinder to the front pivot of the air cylinder in the retracted position. So we're going to model we're going to model this in two positions simultaneously. We're going to have two separate pieces of geometry that represent the same mechanical parts in two different positions. And that's important. And then Cat 
trash. <laughs> All right, everybody got what I have on my screen? Yeah, let's create another line. This is going to represent the cylinder in the extended position. So start at the back, pivot, put the line out in the middle space. Once again, just like we did before, it's going to be 13.02. You could do this a different way, right? We know that this line is going to be four inches longer than this line because that's the stroke length, right? So you could, instead of instead of typing in 13.02, you can click on the 9.02 dimension. Remember how we did this? How you can make dimensions related to each other, and then you could just do plus four, right? It'll give you the same thing. But then if, if you change which cylinder you're using or something, you change this length, this length will update. You can do it either way. I would recommend doing it with the equation because that's technically more it's more correct representation of what's actually going on. Just plus four. Just click on the 9.02 dimension and then plus four. Okay. Now to make this easier on yourselves, I want you to I want you to reposition some of the geometry ahead of time so that you don't get a bunch of weird constraints and have to do a bunch of work down the road. Okay? So the end point of the long 13-inch line, you should make sure it's past the one and a half inch line. Make sure it's on this side, right? The 9.2 inch line, you should make sure the angle's up a little higher and you want it to be on this side. Of, of this vertical line, okay? So just drag your lines, make sure they're both above horizontal. Now you want them to be above horizontal, not below horizontal, above horizontal, and, and then on either side. Got that? Yep. If you have it, I want you to nod, or say yes. yes. So click line, connect to the end of the nine inch line, Connect to the pivot point of the mechanism, which is the top of this one and a half inch line. Click again, right to place that line. Then you're gonna do the same thing for the 13 inch line. Click at the end of the 13 inch line, and then place that at the, or at the, um, the pivot point as well. What do these two lines represent? Triangles. The mechanism and its various positions? Yes, specifically what part of the mechanism? The lever. The lever. Right, the lever that we're going to use to actuate the mechanism. But yes, it's part of the mechanism. So what is the, are these two, what do the, these two lines represent the lever? Why are there two lines instead of just one? Because one's for when it's extended and one's for when it's retracted. Right. So there's, it's representing the same physical mechanical part in two different positions. Right? So can they be different lengths? Maybe if they're magical. No, right. No, no, no. They can't. So we're gonna we're gonna put an equals constraint on these two lines to make sure they're always the same length because it's the same part in two different positions. We want it to have the same length. So equals. Click on one. Click on the other. Adjust. So boring. You don't even allow magical parts. No, I I don't allow magical parts. All right, so now what did I, I, I mentioned it very briefly, so you guys remember, do you guys remember how, what, how, how much of an angle we want to, how, how much of an angular stroke we want this to be? Nine degrees. Nine degrees. So we're going to use the dimension tool to do that. We're going to click on dimension. We're going to click on each of the two lever arm lines. We're going to place the dimension down. We're going to type in 90 degrees. You can, you can sit here and adjust it. Right? You can. I don't know. I can't figure out what I did before. I don't know. 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 I don't your, your assembly, hey, you guys, your assemblies should not be fully constrained. If it says one, it should say one dimension yeah, needed. Yeah. Uh, oh, 
Okay, we need guys to just remember when you get assemblies that are do this complicated that have weird interrelations, they can get a little finicky. You, you gotta be pretty careful how you put them together, which is why I had you do it the way I had you do it, because that was the way that was gonna Wait, what's the button you press for the angular thing again? The angle you just use the dimension tool. Oh okay. And you just click two lines that aren't parallel and it'll put them get an angular dimension. Okay. Okay. So we have one degree of freedom, right? We we can we can we have one adjustment. We have one dimension that we have to place before this is fully constrained. So let's let's look at well let's let's place one thing down here just to make this more intuitive. I did it in your book. Go to arc, go to the drop down and click the center point arc. Click on the pivot point, click on the end point of one of the air cylinder slash lever lines, and then click on the end point of the other one. All right, so this arc represents this arc represents the, the path that the end point follows. I, I make it a construction line just because it's more intuitive. Okay, so as the cylinder extends, it's going to follow this path. <coughs> right? So let's let's look at let's look at the air cylinder in this position. Okay, now remember, we're, we, got a, we got an air cylinder in here. The rod is extended, okay? Which direction is the cylinder exerting force in, in the extended position? What we want to know is the force line. You guys remember last week when we were talking about torque? What's the force line in the air cylinder in its extended position? Anybody know? The line. It's, it's the this, line. This line, right? It's the line that connects the set the pit back pivot of the cylinder to the, the front pivot of the yeah. cylinder. That's the force line, right? The center of the cylinder. Okay? So this line is actually a force line as well. Okay? In in the in the retracted position, we are, when we first start extending, it's retracted. That's this is the force line. Okay? The thing you've got to remember is as the cylinder extends, the force line is always going to be facing the same direction. So as it extends, it's going to kind of do one of these, right? And the force is always going to be facing a particular direction. So this is the pivot here. So in the extended position, what's the moment? Smaller. Right, what well, kind of answer are you looking well, for? Well, I just want to know where, where would it be, right? Would it be you know, here would be here, you know. Uh, I have you come up and draw it. I'll, I'll stop. <laughs> the, the moment, the moment is, is a distance between the line and, and the pivot, right? So it's basically, it's basically a line drawn from the, the pivot to the force line that's perpendicular to the force line. Okay? Now, these two lines are pretty close to perpendicular, not quite perpendicular. Perpendicular is probably more like that. Right, it's closed. So, how much torque do we have here? Right, in comparison to here, right? I guess comparing to less, but a lot less, right? I mean, the length of this line is tiny in comparison to the length of, of, of this line. Right? And it, depending on our mechanism, right, that might be advantageous, right? To have a, a lot of torque at the beginning of the stroke and very little torque at the end. Okay, but let's look at let's look at a little bit of a different arrangement, right? Let, let's assume let's assume there's something crazy about our mechanism. We kind of just want constant torque throughout the whole range of motion. Just let's just assume that for a second. So let's look at a slightly different arrangement of these lines. Let's let's move this up so that we're more like that, right? So now the moment is. that and something like that, right? They're, they're a lot closer to the same. Now what happens, what happens when the air cylinder goes up on top of this arc, right, as it's extending? Right, what's going to happen to the moment as, as the cylinder gets up here at the top of this arc? There'll be more torque. You get more torque, right? So right, right at the top, somewhere, somewhere 
in the middle-ish. It's not going to be exactly in the middle because you've got a little bit of an angle to deal with. But, but somewhere close to the middle, you're going to have peak torque. But, but it's only going to be you know, the radius of this arc, right? So, so it's, it's still fairly close. It's maybe 50 or 60% more than, than this lowest torque that we've got in the system. Okay? So as we kind of get these two lines that are kind of like closer to each other, we kind of balance out the torque curve throughout the whole range of motion. Now, if we have something weird where we've got a, a mechanism that's like extended out and it's really heavy, and then as we pull it in or push it out, the center of gravity gets closer to vertical or something and it, and it gets easier to move, maybe we want to offset this weird to get kind of a good leverage in one position and bad leverage in the other. That might be advantageous. But Assuming we kind of just want even torque across the whole range of motion, as these two lines get closer together, it kind of balances out the torque into the full range of motion. Okay? So what we're going to do is we're just going to do, we're just going to take it to the best case scenario, which is where these two lines are collinear. Okay? We're going to, we're going to place a constraint to make them collinear. So we're going to use the collinear constraint, which is this one second from the left at the top of the constraint grid. Click on that, click on one of the air cylinder lines, click on the other of the air cylinder lines. Did you guys all not get what I got? Nope. I got helpers. I got it. I just clicked. Go linear, and I click one air cylinder line the other. So now we've got we've got two lines that are kind of just right on top of each other right here. We got the air cylinder's retracting position is here, and then the air cylinder in its extended position is on top. Because these two lines are, are collinear, the starting, the torque at the retracted position and the torque at the extended position is at the same. It, it, it's the same. At the moment is the same at the start and end of the stroke. And then in the middle, it gets a little higher in the middle, and then it gets it drops off towards the end. So it starts low, gets a little higher, then gets low again. Okay? Now typically, typically speaking, um, just based on the types of mechanisms that we do in FRC, typically the most torque that you're going to need is going to be at the beginning or end of the stroke, right? Or, or maybe at the end. So you kind of know if you have enough torque, if you use this, if you use the measure tool to measure from here to this line, it'll tell you what the moment is. You can use the force of your air cylinder to figure that out, right? We know that we know that our our air cylinder gives us about 53 pounds. If you know what the you multiply that by the the moment, that'll tell you what the torque is. So we know we know that minimum torque is going to be at the start and end, and if we know if we need the most torque at the start and end, and we have enough torque to do it, you, you kind of know you're safe, right? You know you're not going to have less torque in the middle of the stroke. So if you're if you're good at the ends, you'll have a little more torque in the middle, you'll be good. Now for a more complicated application, we might care more about what that torque profile looks like, and we we'd adjust this to optimize it a little bit. But in a lot of simple cases, this is a pretty good general balance that you can use. So. Um, that's all we're going to do for today. That's the layout sketch. We're going to base all the geometry of our joint off of this, of all the parts, and put it together. So, good job, guys. Okay. And make sure you save that sketch. Just, just call it, just call it joint layout. <laughs>